Hi everyone and welcome to our YouTube channel. If it is your first time joining us, please remember to hit the subscribe button. Look, we have an amazing message that is lined up for you guys. To watch the full service, you can click on the link below. But for now, let's have a look at this message. Father, we just thank you for your word today. We thank you for who you are. We ask today that you will touch us in an incredible way. Work through us. Let today not just be a message. Let it not just be information, but change who we are on the inside. I pray that you'll do something remarkable. For everyone in this room, I pray that you'll pour out enormous blessing. Shift us. Shift us. Sh perform surgery where it's needed. Let us not just become complacent, but to live for you differently. In Jesus' name, amen. Everyone okay today? Yes. It's good to have you all of you online with us today as well. We're really excited that you joined us. And uh, I'm starting a new series today. Uh, it's an exciting series. It's one part. It starts today and ends today. <laughs> and uh, the purpose of this message, I really hope today will help you to uh, think a little differently about your walk with Jesus. Is that okay? Yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's not going to be the particularly easy message to listen to. It's not really the goal. The goal today is that I really hope to, to stimulate, challenge, and inspire each and every one of us to be a bit different, not because there's anything we're doing wrong, but because we need to know how we are doing. Is that okay? Yeah. Bottom line is we assess everything. Yeah. Uh, there's assessment happening every single day of your life. If, if you're hoping to lose weight, one of the things you will tend to do is stand on the scale, and we hope that the numbers will be smaller than they were yesterday, <laughs> or at least smaller than they were last week. Yeah. There's an assessment. Yeah. Uh, there's assessment in business, that depending on the kind of organization you hope to run uh, or that you do run, uh, we measure differently. We might measure uh, our finances weekly. We might measure them bi-monthly. It could be mon monthly, quarterly, whatever the case is. There is always a time of assessment. We're hoping that our organizations are functioning better and more profitably one month to the next, right? That would be, that would be wise. I mean, even in South Africa at the moment, across the globe, we're looking at COVID infections. Never in the history of mankind has anybody been as, as, as interested in medical results. So we spend a lot of time looking at COVID stats. If I said to you, you know, what are the infections yesterday you would shout out? 9,000, 2,000, someone's wrong. You've got a Fong Kong website though. You, what does yours say? Today it says, today it says nothing. See, see? Eight and a half. Eight and a half people or eight and a half thousand? Just checking. So there's measurements, they matter, right? Every single one of us are going on a journey. Uh, when, you're, when you're getting married, you, you get excited, you count down the days. Then after you're married, you still count down the days. <laughs> And there's this journey of discovery and unraveling what looks like it's working or isn't. There's an, there's an investigation for assessment. At university, you're assessed. We don't just go to university, attend for four years, leave university and have a degree. They don't go, oh, that was wonderful, you participated. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Uh, there's an assessment process. School, there's a, we're always assessing. Sadly, we don't assess our spiritual lives, though. We don't assess our spiritual lives. We don't know whether we're closer to Jesus this year than we were last or last month, this month than we were last. We don't necessarily know whether we're drawing closer to him. We don't necessarily know that, that we are better at following Christ now than we were yesterday. We don't know. Very few of us take time to focus on that as a process to getting closer to Jesus. We don't spend a time on it. And the reason we don't is because we hear so often that our walk with Christ is not about performance. All right, standing with Christ isn't about performance. It's actually about potential. And that's true. It's 100% true. However, we assume that that means that we can just stay the way we are forever. How many of us, come on, we all know this. How many of us have someone in our world that has remained unchanged for years and they are no closer to Jesus than when you first met them? Five years ago, 10 years ago, last week, I don't know. How many of us are not taking any time to assess? Assessment matters. Yeah. We need to assess. We need to assess in our country. Are we happy with the way our government is performing? Don't answer that. Are you happy with how our government's performing? We should be assessing. Are we happy with how our children are performing? Are they growing? Are they becoming better people? Are we getting closer to releasing them out the home as productive members of society? Yeah. Assessment matters. Yeah. We should be assessing everything. It's good to assess. Because if we don't assess, we say, accept the status quo. And here's the problem. Once we've accepted the status quo, we'll never grow. Yeah. We need to be change agents. We are not called to live on this planet to be simple followers of the routine. Right. And if we simply go with the flow, we allow politicians 
and medical fraternities to determine how we live and how we function. They will, in fact, even have a say in what pronouns to use when talking to people. They'll have a say in, in, in how we address one another. In fact, we go as far as this. We have to legislate being nice. Isn't it bizarre that we live on a planet where the law is in place to make sure that we're nice? What law? Well, we, it's, it's legislated that we, that we shouldn't be racist. It's legislated that we should be accepting of all different gender identities. It's legislated that we, we have to be careful about what we say. And isn't that bizarre? Because as followers of Christ, if you and I have chosen to love Jesus and obey him, we should know that by sheer nature of relationship with Jesus Christ. And if every single one of us as followers of Christ simply lived according to the invitation Christ gives us, the law would be irrelevant because we don't need to legislate being nice. Yeah. Isn't that true? It's like we, the, the, at some point there's going to be a law that tells us how we should cook a meal or a law to tell us how often we should have people over to our house. Yeah. Because at this stage, the only thing that humanity believes that works is law. We've got to put enough laws in place, but we all know laws don't work. Yeah. And you might go, oh, I'm completely obedient of the law. Well, that would be true if you didn't drive at 62 kilometers per hour on those urban roads yeah. coming here today. That's right. Because if you drove at 62, you broke the law. And we all know that the speed limit in South Africa is a mere suggestion. We don't, we don't, yeah, no. Now, just stop for a minute. I'm, I'm, I'm not illustrating for a moment. I'm suggesting for a moment that performance is, is important. What I am suggesting, and I hope that we catch this, is that evaluation is important. Perfection is not required. Christ has never expected perfection. He never has, never will. Perfection is not the issue. Potential is. And if you and I can understand what that looks like in, the walk, in our walk with Jesus and our friendship with him, everything changes. And here's the kicker. We spend so much time trying to, to figure out what it means to come and find Jesus that we miss the journey entirely. Finding Jesus is not the end in and of itself. It is not the goal. Finding Jesus is a problematic phrase because Jesus was never lost. We don't find Jesus. We encounter him. And when we choose to encounter him, we choose from that point on to consistently deepen our intimacy with him so that over time we become more like him. And as a result of that, we start to live a fuller, richer, more purposeful life. It is not about performance. However, it should still be improvement. And that's what we need to measure. And one of the things that we need to do is to figure out what that looks like. I wanted to ask you today, is your physical health good? You'd go to a doctor, they would look at some vital signs. Those vital signs would be an indicator of some kind as to the nature of our growth. Well, there are seven signs, or sorry, six signs that we're going to talk about today. Six signs of spiritual growth. They are not things that we need to do necessarily as much as they are things that we need to look for in our world. And if we look for these things in our lives and we find these signs, there's evidence or there is an indication that there is some form of spiritual growth. And that's really what we're hoping for. So the message title today is Signs of Spiritual Growth. And we're going to kick it off by looking at how important it is to assess. Now, there was a guy called John, uh, one of Jesus' closest mates. He was a, a really great guy. Uh, John never had a confidence issue. Uh, what I love about John is that he was really confident about uh, who Jesus was in his world and, and what he felt he was to Jesus. In fact, he's the guy that documented at some point, he wrote this down, that I'm the one that Jesus loved. He referred to himself as the disciple that Jesus loved. If we look at this a little bit more accurately, it's kind of what he was saying south of Joburg kind of style was, the rest of them are pond scum, I'm the one. That's what John was saying. I, like, like he, he lo- the other guys were okay, but he loved me. I'm, I'm like the favorite. And, and John lived his life confident of who Jesus was. Confident of God's godliness. In other words, his deity. That's the right word to describe that, that, that facet of God. How, how much God was Jesus. And John had a, an incredible understanding of that. But he also had an incredible understanding of the love of Jesus. He felt the enormous weight of, of the love of Christ on him. And, uh, and he taught humanity. He gave us some indications that we need to do things differently. He said this in 3 John. Are you ready for this? 3 John 1. Put on your helmets. Put in your mad God. Let's get going. 3 John 1. He said this, dear friend. So who's he writing to? People who are already followers of Christ. He's talking to people who have said and have claimed that they are intimate with Jesus. He said, dear friend, I hope all is well with you and that, uh, and that you are as healthy in body as you are strong 
in spirit. Yeah. Now, here's a couple of keys. He's showing us two things, just in that first sentence. He's showing us that we should be evaluating. How well are you? I hope you're well. Do you know if you're well or not? That's kind of the context. I hope you're well. But then he's drawing an incredible distinction. He's saying part and parcel of your health, part and parcel of your physical health is that your physical health is directly tied to your spiritual health. So here's the challenge that we have in humanity at the moment. We spend bucket loads of our medical aids num- uh, in- uh, income, bucket loads of our resource, our medical aid resource, on going to doctors to determine if we're healthy physically or not. And we don't spend a cent trying to determine whether we're healthy spiritually or not. Here's the problem. There are some of us in this room, some of us online today that are ill, not because we've got a physical issue, but because we've got a spiritual issue. How much time have you spent to determine whether you're spiritually healthy? Because if we're spiritually healthy, we will ultimately be physically healthy. They're tied together. He goes on to say this in verse 3. Some of the traveling teachers recently returned and made me very happy by telling me about your faithfulness and that you live, are living according to the truth. Say it with me, you're living according to the truth. Now, here's the kicker. Again, he's saying that there's some form of assessment. There's some kind of evaluation. He had sent traveling preachers out. They came back and gave him a report. They were accountable for what they saw. They saw that their people were living according to the truth. The conjunction here is key. The word the is not the word a. I saw you living to according to a truth. You are living according to the, the, the truth. You're married to the wife, not a wife. It's an emphatic conjunction. There is only one. You are living according to the truth. In other words, we can't take what Christ has given us, customize our Christianity to suit the lifestyle choices we hope to make. It's not a convenient truth. It's not a truth. I have this truth and you have this truth and you have this truth and all of our three truths can live simultaneously in this plethora of of wonderful truthfulness that is all relative. That's vomit. (laughs) The reality is that there is the truth. And we might go, no, that's unfair. We're not taking into account the complexities of life. Well, let me just say it this way. If you decided to get on an airplane and fly somewhere and the pilot said, I just want to let you know that we are compliant to a truth. A standard we follow is the one that we like the most is we are very, very serious about the takeoff procedures. Landing, however, you know, we don't, like, we don't care too much about that. We like to land by the seat of our pants because we want the exci- landings to be exciting. If there's someone on the runway, woohoo, this is going to be fun. Now, would that change your mind a little? We'd go, no, no, surely, 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 there has to be a standard that everybody adopts. And if there's an A standard that everybody adopts, it becomes... The standard that everybody adopts. And that's why we don't have too much of an issue getting on an airplane. Because if the radio procedures were different in every country and every pilot and, and every airline just adopted, well, I'm just, I, I like that philosophy. <laughs> there we have, listen, aren't you just grateful that you're driving at 120 k's or in South Africa at anything, any speed whatsoever on the highway, that everybody's going in the same direction on the same side of the road? Yeah. What if someone said, well, I, you know, we don't like the standard of, the, of driving on the left-hand side of the road or right, driving on the right-hand side of the road. We would just like to be somewhat, somewhat different. You know? I prefer being on the right-hand side of the road. We wouldn't be overly excited about that. We may even wave using beautiful hand gestures, using only one of our digits, waving and saying, hi, we are so glad that you are driving on this side of the road. You are a wonderful human being. We'll be tolerant of that for you. There's a standard. Yes? So we need to know that if we are going to be growing and progressing, we need to make sure that we have a standard that we follow. And it's the truth, not a truth. I have no greater joy than to hear my children are following the truth. And what we start to see is that John is inviting us to assess and he's assessing according to God's standards. And then he's saying in the midst of these God's standards, there's great impact because the impact is that when you're spiritually healthy, you'll be physically healthy. He's saying that when you, you and I are linked to this incredible truth that we live faithfully, that we have the truth, not a truth, not a convenient mix. And that when you do that and you live that way, there's bring, you bring great joy to God. And, and, and at least, listen, if you and I are followers of Christ, if we accepted the invitation to live a richer, fuller life, surely, 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 the very least we could do is bring joy to God. Yeah. 
Because bottom line is, if we do what Christ calls us to do, we live by his standards, we don't need to be legislated by law to accomplish something that we would do intrinsically anyway. Do we need a law that says we should not be racist? Now, I'm not saying that it's okay to be racist. I completely have a different view entirely. But the, the, law, the law says we cannot say anything racist. But why don't we just apply what Jesus said? Yeah. Did Jesus not say, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and love others as you love yourself? If we simply applied Jesus' words, there would be no racism. There would, be not, there would not be any sexism. There would not be any abuse. There would not be any theft and crime because we would simply apply what Jesus taught. So here's the question again. Are we growing closer to Jesus? Is there spiritual growth? If you and I need a law to govern how we speak to people, I would question that there is no spiritual growth in your life because you and I need to ultimately just simply do what Jesus asks us to do. Jesus' precepts are not there to restrict us, hold us back, or, 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 or remove our freedoms. They are completely the opposite. They're there to elevate us, inspire us, and equip us to live a richer life. It's just a choice we have to make. So how do we know what we need to do? Well, here, are the, here are the things that we see, the signs that we see in our lives. You ready? Here's the first sign. No, here's not the first sign. Here's the first scripture I want to read that points to the first sign. Hebrews 4. Look at this. Paul writing to a developing church, the community, instructing him. Look at this. He says, God's promise, are you ready? God's promise of entering his rest still stands. Now, in this context, we're looking at, yes, eternal life with God in heaven. Absolutely. But we mustn't forget that when God speaks of his rest, when God speaks of a relationship with him, it's not just eternity, it's on earth now. So God is saying that my, my promise for eternal life with me in heaven still stands, but it also, the promise for my favor on earth now still stands. So we ought, are you ready? We ought to, we ought to tremble with fear that some of you might fail to experience it. Have we entertained the thought that we might be living in a way that we think we're glorifying God and that we are developing right standing with him over time? And that we will spend eternal life with God in heaven for eternity only to find that we didn't. Is it possible? Added to that, is it possible that we think that we are so consumed with how we live our lives for Jesus that we neglect that there are people around us every single day whom we love, but not enough to help them enter into an intimate relationship with Jesus? Should we not fear and tremble against that? Surely we should be thinking, oh my word, is that possible? For the good news, for this good news that Jesus or that God has prepared this rest has been announced to us just as it was to them, but it did not, it did them no good because they didn't, share, look at this, they didn't share the faith of those who listened to God. For only he who believes can enter his rest. We need to evaluate who we are. We need to evaluate whose we are. We need to evaluate the outcome of our world so that we can know for sure that we are growing spiritually. Because if we miss those things, we become ultimately consumed with the comforts of life and not the purpose of life. And as followers of Christ, we need to make that assessment. We need to make that adjustment, realign our lives. And that's why this message is going to be a little tough because it's intended to shake us to the point going, all right, I don't see that sign. I need to work at something different. You ready for that? Here's the first sign. If you and I have a sign of spiritual growth, we have a concern for others' spiritual health. Profoundly important. Profoundly important. Do we have a concern for someone else's spiritual health? It's tied directly to the last instruction Christ gave humanity. Jesus died, was buried, raised from the dead. Not too long after that, was taken up to heaven. It's called ascension. He was ascended into heaven. And in that, just before he did that, he, he said this. In Matthew 28, another one of Jesus' friends, Matt, wrote this down. Therefore, say it with me, therefore, go make disciples. And we go, oh yeah, that's for the full-time ministry. No, it isn't. Therefore, go and make disciples for all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey the commands I'm giving you and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. 
That instruction is critical. Now, here's the thing. As followers of Christ, we don't treat this as, as it is known as the Great Commission. We look at this as the Great Suggestion. Yeah. I'll ask a question. How many of us in this room who claim to be followers of Christ, I'm choosing my words carefully, who claim to be followers of Christ, in other words, you've chosen to love Jesus and obey Him, how many of us in this room, any one of us online, have ever led someone into an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ personally? I want that awkward silence to settle. Because here's the kicker. If you and I have never led someone into an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ personally, we've already failed in our spiritual growth. Jesus did not say, therefore, gather as Bridge Church and hope that others will make disciples of some nations. If you're brave enough, if you've got a degree in theology, if you're happy enough, if you've got very receptible friends. The point of the gather is to go. Over the last period of time, I find it profound how many followers of Christ are so excited about opening up churches and saying we cannot wait to get into the physical presence of God again and to get into the presence of other people and worship and have coffee together and sing and all that kind of stuff. And, and everybody's so amped about it, but the question is wrong. Is it about church at all? Because the reality is that you don't need to have church to lead someone into the presence of God. You don't need to come to church to be able to help someone that you work with, your family members, your neighbors, your kids, your kids' friends. You don't have to have a church building in order to lead that person into an intimate relationship with Jesus, forever altering the trajectory of their lives and helping them to have a purposeful life. The building is, in, is, is unnecessary for that goal. And yet, if I had to say to you, raise your hands, I would imagine that well over 95% of people in this room and 95% of the people watching online have never, ever led someone into the presence of Jesus Christ or led them into a relationship with Jesus Christ personally. So let's just start there for a moment. Is there a sign of spiritual growth in your life? No, because you're not leading people into that relationship. And then the argument is always the same. I've heard it many times. I'm not trained enough. I don't know enough. I'm too scared. If I invite my boss, what will they say? They might fire me. But by the way, if I might lose a friend. Now, here's the question. Are you more interested in your friend's friendship or your friend's eternal life with the person of Jesus Christ? And then... The biggest kicker of all is that we forget that when Jesus gave us that instruction, he promised he would be with us. He said this in verse 20, I am with you always, even till the end of the age. In other words, if your boss does fire you because you tried to lead them to Jesus, he's going to be with you. If your neighbor wants to move, he's still with you. If your friends go, well, now you've become one of those Jesus freaks, you're free. Jesus is still with you. And I'm not suggesting that you walk up there with a big study Bible and hit them on the head. Don't do that. That's weird. Don't go and stand up in the church office tomorrow beating your chest going, I want you to meet Jesus. That's also weird. You might leave the building from the second floor window. It's not a good idea. But it does mean that you and I can be creative and think about it and process, drawing closer to people, finding ways to connect with people, drawing them into an intimate relationship with Jesus. But that is our mandate. The gather is to go. We gather as a church too. Go is the church. So that's our mandate. And if we're not moving in that direction, there is no evidence, no evidence of spiritual growth. You cannot accept that I will accept or anyone who's committed to Jesus will accept that simply because you say you're a follower of Christ that you are. It has to be evidenced by fruit in your life that points to that fact. You cannot claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ and not have an incredible passion to see people around you get to know who Jesus is. You cannot be a committed follower of Christ, an intimate relationship with Jesus, and be okay with people who used to be followers of Christ in your life drifting away from Him. You cannot be. You and I need to be committed to the journey. So what can we do? Well, number one, we can invite people to church. That's a good thing to do. 
You can certainly invite people to church. It's a way. It's not the way. It's a way. I would still suggest as far as possible, lead as many people that you know into personal intimate relationship with Jesus one-on-one. It's the far better approach. It's a far more meaningful approach. It changes everything. You should be doing that anyway, but invite people to church. What a great place to start. We can lead people into a relationship with God one-on-one. And we, can, we can serve people through the church. Oh my word, you cannot claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ and not be willing to serve. Sorry, it doesn't fit. Because Jesus Christ, the greatest servant of all, said this, I came not to be served, but to serve. In other words, if you and I are uh, intimate with Jesus, His nature will become our nature, making us servant-hearted, not serviced. So if you're sitting in the room today and going, oh, I'm I'm not going to listen to this, my arms are folded, that's great, we'll get to a point that'll help you just now. But when your arms are folded, and I'm not going to receive this. There's no spiritual growth. Because how much you know of Scripture is meaningless unless you reflect the person of Jesus Christ. This is a tougher one. Investing into God's work through the local church in the form of time, talent, and treasure is part of being concerned of other people's spiritual health. Very quiet now. Because time and talent is easy. That's got to do with my time and talent, my skills. I can make time for that. Treasure is a little more difficult. And I find it interesting that as soon as we speak about money in church, so-called spiritual people get really ticked off. Heard yesterday that this uh, uh, person, long story short, in Connect Group was anti-tithing. I, can I just say this to you? And they use this word, with anti-bridges tithing. It's a bit of a <laughs> stupid statement. Um, because here's the issue. Tithing is not about bridge. Never has been, never will be. Tithing isn't about any church anywhere on the planet. Tithing is a God thing. Tithing has nothing to do with your local church at all. It has everything to do with the principle that God gave us to show that we are in love with Him. Because here's the deal. When you give your life to Jesus Christ, bottom line, He's coming after your money. Clarity. Bridge is not coming after your money. God is. (laughs) So when, when you give your heart to Jesus, he's going, yeah, that's great. You say you love me, but how tight is the cord from your heart to your wallet? So make no mistake, if you want a relationship with Jesus Christ, he's coming after your money. Why? Because he's after your heart. And your heart, unfortunately, we all know this, is attached to our wallet. Where your treasure is, your heart will be. Also, we all know this to be true. And the super spiritual among us go, oh, of course it's true. Oh, yeah, but no, no, it isn't. Tithing's Old Testament. No, you're Old Testament. <laughs> get out of the legalese and get into a relationship. You may help today? Yes. So bottom line is the more intimate we are with Jesus, the greater our concern for others for him. We want people to be close to Jesus. We want people to know him. That's going to take our time. It's going to take our talent. It's going to take our treasure. It's going to take helping others know what the love of Jesus Christ is. And that means you and I are required to be there. Here's the question once again. Do we have a massive passion for those far from Jesus? Because if we do, then there's a sign of spiritual growth. You'll be helped. The second thing, the second sign that helps us. It's going to get easier now, guys. It's good. You can can chill. The second thing is uh, knowledge and understanding combined with faith. A a sign of spiritual growth is knowledge and understanding combined with faith. This is important. There are three facets that we're talking about here. Knowledge, understanding, and faith. So let me say it like this. Many of us know of Jesus, but not every one of us knows Jesus. We can know of someone and not have any real intimacy with them. One of my favorite actors is Robert De Niro. I know of Robert De Niro, but make no mistake, and I'm grateful for this, I do not know him intimately like his wife does. I know of Robert De Niro, but I don't know Robert De Niro. Here's the thing. How many of us know of Jesus, but don't know Jesus? Now, if we're going to know someone, it means that there needs to be some kind of knowledge transfer, right? For example, if you go on a date, the purpose of a date is to have conversation. That's why we say to the young people in our church, it's more important to have conversation than consummation. You've got to have a lot more conversation than any other activity. The conversation helps us to get to know one another. It helps us to ask the right questions and to find out your values and dreams and goals and to find out whether you actually like them at all. 
that takes knowledge. I mean, that develops knowledge. That knowledge takes time. It means that you and I, if we are going to have a relationship with Jesus, need to date him. Because only once we've learned to date Jesus can we marry him. And only once we've married Jesus do we start to see that intimacy expand and deepen and the spiritual growth we're looking for happens. So we need to date Jesus. Here's another question. Don't raise your hands. It'll be weird. Here's this question. How many of us in this room, how many of us online have had intentional, deliberate date with Jesus this week, last week, this year? When last did you make a time consciously to diarize into your diary my time with Jesus and then made sure that nothing distracted you from that meeting? How much time did you spend reading the word in that meeting, reading God's, reading the Bible, reading about him? How much time did you take, uh, take writing down the things that you're praying for, the things you're thankful for, what you believe God is teaching you and showing you? How much time did you spend praying for others? How much time did you spend worshiping in that meeting? How much time did you spend in appointment with Jesus? Because if you didn't, there is no spiritual growth. Because what we're trying to do is this. We're trying to have one meal a week. We're coming to the restaurant called Bridge Spiritual Restaurant. We're coming one service of the weekend, getting our breakfast, and then hoping to be fully sustained and healthy for the rest of the week until our next breakfast appointment at Bridge Church. Spiritual growth requires of us knowledge of who Jesus is. Once we have spent time with Jesus and we start doing all of those things I've just mentioned, what starts to happen is we start to get understanding. We start to understand the things that God is doing and the things that God is saying. And what ends up starting to happen is we have another Christianese word. It's called revelation. It drops from head to heart. And that's when we have a deep conviction and a deep understanding and a deep faith about what we believe. And here's an amazing thing. The more we spend time with God and the more understanding we start to obtain, the better that relationship becomes. Here's the key. The relationship and the understanding take time. So how do we get to get more understanding? Well, one way is connect groups. Get involved, get involved with a connect group with great leaders and great like-minded people, all passionate uh, in this journey towards getting to know who Jesus is so that we can ask questions, we can apply the message, we can say, I don't understand that, help people explain it to you. So you start to grasp it and one of a sudden you get a big brain moment, boom, I get it. And then it becomes understanding. But that's not where we leave it. We've got to take knowledge and understanding and combine it with faith. In fact, faith becomes the glue that bonds understanding and knowledge together. Because here's the kicker. God told us that we'll never know everything about him. In fact, there'll be many things throughout our lives that we will never understand. And and, and we can read the Bible more, we can pray more, we can worship more, and we still won't get it. But here's what the good news is. is when we bind knowledge and understanding together with faith, we recognize that we may not fully understand everything, but the things that we do understand, we can trust fully. And it allows us to live in that world where we go, I don't get it, but I can trust God more than the results. I can believe that he's still good. And I don't know how this is going to pan out, but I'm confident in his love for me and his passion for me. Hebrews 2 verse 4 verse 2 in the Living Bible says this, but it didn't do them any good because they didn't believe it. Look at this. They didn't mix it with faith. They didn't mix their knowledge and understanding with faith. And that's the key that holds us together. And if there is great faith and if there's knowledge and understanding, there is spiritual growth. Here's the question. How passionate are we about gaining knowledge and understanding and bonding it together with faith? It'll help us to determine our spiritual growth. Number three, uh, the third sign is a soft, pliable, teachable heart. There's a difference between soft and pliable. Three different words that all ultimately end up in the same thing, the same result. Here it is, soft. Silk is soft. Silk is soft. You can touch it and it's soft to the touch, but if you try and shape it, it just collapses into a pile. Here's another interesting thing. Molding clay or plasticine is also soft, but it's also pliable. So it's soft enough to mold and shape, but once you've molded and shaped it, it stays where it is. It carries a form. When you're soft and pliable, you become teachable. You become teachable, but you can only become teachable if you're soft and pliable. So we need to be open to the input from leaders. We need to be open to the input from the word. We need to be open to to the investment that God has for us. But more than that, we need to be willing to be shaped into who Christ needs us to become. 
And when those two things tie together, we become teachable. And only when we become teachable do we grow more intimate with Jesus. And as a result, we see spiritual growth. Soft hearts are important. That's why Hebrews 4 verse 7, Paul says this, Today, when you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. So you're hearing his voice today, God's word. The Holy Spirit is talking to you today. He's talking to us. He's saying, listen, don't harden your heart. Because if you harden your heart, you can never grow. (laughs) Most of the issues we deal with that we don't like in the local church, because let's face it, the local church would have been absolutely outstanding. This one would be perfect, but you came. (laughs) And I came. We're all imperfect. The church is never perfect. But we're able to cope with the imperfection of the local church when we have a soft heart. The reason many people don't like to talk about money in church is a hard heart. The many people, reason that pe- many people don't like to talk about serving in the church is a hard heart. The reason that many, so many people don't like talking about sexual purity in the church is because of a hard heart. So the reason people don't like talking about not living with someone whom, with whom you're not married is a hard heart. And yes, I've heard people say, I do believe in sex and marriage. At least one of the people should be married. <laughs> hard heart. Are you all Okay. Let's get to that point where we realize that we need to be soft-hearted so that we can be pliable, so that we can become teachable, so that we become more intimate with Jesus. And there's a building block. So this is going to help you. There's a building block. If we want to build on our, on our uh, spiritual growth, we need to start with a soft heart. It's the bottom st- stage of the, of, the, of, the, of the building block. So soft heart creates room for belief. The more soft-hearted we are, the more we are open to new ideas, concepts, thoughts, and understandings. Our belief paves the way for faith. So once we've got a soft heart, we can create room for belief. The belief creates way for faith. Faith is the doorway to intimacy. You cannot please God without faith. So you and I need to transact with heaven. The currency of heaven is faith. We need to work on that. Intimacy then is the foundation of a relationship with Christ. So it starts with a soft heart. Build from the soft heart to belief, from belief to faith, from faith to intimacy. From intimacy to relationship, and here's the thing. Once we've got a relationship with Jesus, we start to obey Him. Because the relationship with Christ is the foundation of obedience to Christ. We will never obey someone to whom we are not passionately in love. That's why I come back to this whole idea of legislating things. If you and I have a soft heart that leads to belief, that leads to faith, to intimacy, and to relationship with Jesus, we don't need laws to govern our behavior. We don't need laws to govern how we think and act. We choose to be like Christ because we're intimate with Him. So how passionate are we to have a soft, pliable, teachable heart? Because only once we're there do we see spiritual growth. Number four, the fourth sign is acute spiritual awareness. Spiritual awareness is much like any other form of self-awareness. If, if you're looking to raise leaders, one of the things that you've ever done, if you've ever done a psychometric profile or you've ever done some form of leadership development, one of the things that is reported on is our self-awareness. How aware are we of self? Yeah. Uh, and that's okay. And it's important and vital in leadership and obviously uh, emotional, quotient, emotional quotient and all of those things. But it's also equally important spiritually. How spiritually aware are we? Do we know what we're good and bad at? Listen, the bottom line is you all know this to be true. So I'm just repeating the truth. You are led in this church by a fool. I'm an unmitigated idiot, but I'm an unmitigated idiot that loves Jesus and he loves me. And as a result of that, I can learn and grow and be shaped. Now, you all know that to be true, but you're still here, which makes us together. We all need to recognize that we're all imperfect, right? And it's in that imperfection that we allow Jesus to to work in us. I know what my faults are. I know what my flaws are. I try and uh, ring fence them to prevent myself from falling into bad places. And I trust God deeply to shape me and move me and guide me and direct me. But all of us are in the same boat. So let's just do that together. Acute spiritual awareness matters. Hebrews 4.11 says this. So don't let, so let us rather do our best to enter that rest. This is not saying all of a sudden that God wants us to perform a certain way to enter right into heaven and to have right standing with him. It's not the case. He's talking about awareness. Figure it out, in other words. Do your best to figure out how you're wired so that you can live in the favor of God now and for eternity. But if we disobey God as the people of Israel did, we will fall. For the word of God, that's an interesting spin, is powerful. 
and it's sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword cutting between soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes, and it is he to whom we are accountable. So when we read that, it's like, oh my greatness, what just happened? So do we have to work at something? Yes, we do. What do we need to work at? Understanding how we are wired and what our strengths and weaknesses are and how we can become more effective. Part of the journey of fast forward will help us there. But more than that, we need to recognize that the word of God is key. Doing our best isn't about trying to perform for Jesus. It's about being aware of our frailties and our strengths. It's about actively working at intimacy with him. Someone once said to me, the closer you get to Jesus, the more you'll want to spend with Jesus. And you know what? That's true in some cases. I never felt that in my early journey. The more I spent with Jesus, the harder it was. I didn't feel like waking up early and reading the Word of God. I didn't feel like spending time studying the the, the books I couldn't possibly fathom. So I just became more disciplined. I would imagine that each and every one of you have studied at university and there were some courses that you had to take that you really wish you didn't. It wasn't your passion for that subject that got you through. It was discipline. It was just the sheer tenacity to get up and do it. Can I suggest that you need to have the same kind of approach with the Word of God? It may not be all that enjoyable all the time, but be disciplined. Take time to invest in reading His Word and over time, As that starts to settle, that desire will start to grow and you'll be desperate for his word daily. It's about actively working at intimacy. Intimacy isn't easy. You know that in your marriage too. If you want to keep a healthy marriage, it takes work. It's about actively trying to obey Jesus. It's not about being perfect, but it is saying, I know you called me to do this and I'm going to try my very best to apply these principles in my life. And that self-awareness, that willingness to do all of those things stems from the word. Look at this. There's a list that I want to show you. It's so important. Do you know that when you read the word, it reads us? The word of God is not a book. The word of God is not just an historical account. The word of God is not a fairy tale, and nor is the word of God a history of myths. The word of God is living and active, driven by the work of the Holy Spirit, so that when you and I figuratively open the pages if it's a if it's a digital device or literally open the pages on a real device i mean a real book and we start to read it the word of god starts to read us it's it's amazing that we can believe that in science fiction movies but we can't believe that in the word when you and i start reading the word of god it starts to read us it performs spiritual surgery all the time The Holy Spirit with the word starts to shift the way we think and process. It reveals weak, ungodly thoughts and our true desires. In other words, the things that we didn't know we had a motive that was bad or the places that we don't know that we were thinking or the heart, the the bad heart areas that we had, the darkness in us, in our souls, the things that we don't always know that we're going through. The word starts to reveal that and it ticks me off, to be honest, because I like being ignorant of the things I'm bad at at times. It's a whole lot easier. And then I'll be grumpy and Nikki will say something to me and I'll go, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I get crossed with Nikki. Then I go read the word of God and the word starts performing surgery. And God has to talk to me like this. He, I, I don't know that he'll have to talk to you like this. Me, he goes, you're an idiot. And I'll go like, who me? R- wrong destination, R- wrong number. And he'll show me and I'm like, ah, oh, the Greek is right. <laughs> As you read the word, it exposes insecurities and identifies our shortcomings. As we read the word, it cuts to the core of our emotions so that we don't make emotional decisions based on philosophy or moments of, 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 of piousness or piety or whatever. And we start to go through these journeys of recognizing that sometimes our emotions are wrong and it's okay. When we read the word of God, it illuminates the health of our spiritual lives, both good and bad areas. Without which we flounder. So if we don't read the word, how does the Sunday breakfast carry for the rest of your life? How does choosing whether I'm going to spend time in God's word or playing golf impact the outcome of your life? Because if we hope to see spiritual growth, 
we need acute spiritual awareness and acute spiritual awareness is shaped by the word it starts with reading can i encourage you to become biblical literate start reading the word if we're not passionate about reading the word of god here's the my statement you might not like it but it's true if you're not passionate about reading the word of god i question your your intimacy with jesus and there is no spiritual growth number five Strong accountability measured with grace. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. We are accountable to Jesus as we read earlier, but Hebrews 4.15, the high priest, speaking of Jesus, the high priest of ours understands our weakness for he faced all the same testings as we do, yet he did not sin. I want to reiterate this. Christ likeness, being like Christ is not perfection. It's about potential. Jesus is interested in our hearts. He's interested in our friendship with him. Yeah. Our desire to spend more time with him is everything he's looking for within yeah. us. So in the midst of our imperfection, in the midst of getting it wrong, when we're accountable, but we get it wrong, when we make mistakes, we don't get it right. It is not a big stick and a, and a gavel that sends us into condemnation. Rather, he is a loving God that understands we're imperfect, understands our mistakes, forgives those mistakes, forgives those mishaps, and helps us to live more righteously over time. He wants your friendship more than anything else. He wants who you are to be committed to him. He wants to, to know nurture you and love you and direct you and lead you and elevate you and inspire you. He wants to lift the life that you have now to a future life that you can only dream of. He wants to shift the trajectory of your life. He is not looking for your perfection. He's looking for your potential. He wants your heart. You're custom made, designed with purpose. He wants to see you live in your fullness because of his love for you. And yes, we're accountable to him, but he understands us despite that. Which leads to number six, which is confidence. If you want to be able to know whether there's spiritual growth, there will be confidence. The confidence to walk every day and knowing in our imperfection that we don't get it right. But likewise, being so incredibly grateful that we can serve him with absolute forgiveness and mercy. <laughs> it's this unbelievable realization that we're loved. And that whether we get it all right or not. I'm with you always, even till the end of the age. So what does that mean for us today? Well, if there's a problem somewhere, if we've missed the mark somewhere, let's fix it. Let's choose from today on to work on those six areas so that we can in turn assess our spiritual growth, knowing that as imperfect as we are, we're loved beyond measure. You help today? Come by your heads. Everyone at home, everyone in the room. I'd love to invite you to accept the invitation that Christ makes. And sometimes when you hear a message like this, it's sometimes difficult to think, wow, I, I, I'm not sure I want to serve Jesus. It seems quite hard. But I do want to reiterate that the, the levels of perfection that we hope to achieve will never be achieved anyway. Don't stress about it. Let's just try and build friendship with Jesus. That's why Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. It's why he said, he who believes has eternal life. In other words, he's saying, if you want to spend eternal life with God in heaven, and if you want a relationship with him, a friendship with him on earth, it starts with the person of Jesus. Jesus says, I stand at the door of your heart and I knock. And he who hears and answers the, the door and invites me and I'll dine with him and he with me. Jesus wants us to have this friendship so badly that he laid down his life for us. Never once fell short of God's standards, lived perfect. Perfect. The very creation he created rejected him, humiliated him, nailed him onto a cross on which he died. He was buried. Three days later, God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, elevated Jesus to life once again. And if we can believe that, we embark on the most exciting journey of spiritual growth we start to see our purpose realized. We start to live differently, powerfully motivated, inspired to be more, driven to, to live a life of meaning. And all the signs we speak about today start to become more and more prevalent as we are willing to be teachable. And if that's you, if you want to be a part of that today, Everyone online, everyone in the room, if you want to be a part of that exciting journey to partner with the person of Jesus Christ, to, to have a life that is so incredibly valuable, more valuable than you can possibly imagine, then all you need to do right where you sit 
is to say yes to Jesus in the quietness of your heart. Just say yes. Just say yes. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to lead you in a prayer today that helps make that very real for you. So in this room, if you have never accepted Jesus Christ's invitation to a fuller life, if you've never invited Him into your life, and I'm going to encourage you just right where you sit to say yes. If you once have and you've drifted far from Him and you know that you've gone through these things today, you've looked at these signs and you realize I'm far from Him, then why don't you just say, yes, Jesus, I'm coming back to you. I've drifted away, but I want to return to this relationship. Say yes to Jesus. If, online, if you have never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, just say yes to Him. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to pray. I'm going to lead us in a prayer. For those of you in the room today, if that's you, you're accepting Christ as your Lord and Savior for the first time or you're coming back to Him on the count of three, just shoot your hand up. I'm not going to ask you to do anything weird. I just want to see your hand. Then I'm going to ask you to put it down. Here we go. One, two, three. Quickly, shoot your hand up. Beautiful. Beautiful. Wonderful. So many. You can put your hands down. And everyone at home, just say yes. And then pray with me. Everyone in this room is going to be praying out loud and everyone at home as well. Pray out, Lord, pray out loud with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I'm sorry for my sins. I'm sorry for falling short of your standards. Please come into my life. And from this day forward, I choose to follow you. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, come on, give God a huge hand for those people. That's amazing. We trust this message inspired and encouraged you. And if you made a decision to follow Jesus, we'd love to hear about that. So you could either send us a WhatsApp or scan the QR code or click one of the links below. And again, we'd love to hear about the decision you've just made and help you on that journey. Um, but we cannot wait to see you next time.